Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, guests and members. Tonight is July the 25th, 2022, and it's a regular meeting of the West Shore Photography Club. We have a special present or a special evening tonight with a member show and tell. But before we get to that, uh, just a few business items. Next Monday is August the 1st already. Yes, I know. Uh, and there will be no meeting. We're continuing our summer schedule of alternating taking uh, uh, every other Monday night off, pretty much. Uh, on August the 8th, uh, we'll have an image review. Our very own Mike Donovan will be reviewing the images, and there is no theme. So our, our webmaster will open that up uh, uh, within the next few days, and you'll be able to upload your images for the uh, image review on Monday, August the 8th. OK, let's turn it over to Joe to hear about trips past and upcoming. We have um, a trip on, we had a trip on Saturday and uh, let me see, um, is, uh, Mark, can you give an update on that? On Saturday's trip for the waterfall? Oh, well, it was hot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was very complete. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had about 14 people and um, of all different levels. And I, th I thought it went very well. Everybody seemed to be interested. We had people sitting there, you know, in that heat for probably an hour, hour and a half. And um, learned a lot, showed a lot. Joe did a wonderful job of cleaning up the, uh, the waterfalls before we took pictures. <laughs> That's because I could get in the water. That's why, because I cooled my feet off. You had your boots. <laughs> uh, so, okay, great. Thanks, Mark. Um, on this coming, on the Saturday, the 6th of August, we have our next field trip, and that's Fort Hunter. Mary, uh, you want to give an update on that one? Yes, um, Fort Hunter is always fun. On one side there, you're going to have the Fort Hunter Mansion, the Susquehanna River, and then a little further down is a place called Hecton Church, which is on the grounds. And across the street from all of this are, are several buildings that belong to Fort Hunter, and then some homes where people actually live. And there's also a covered bridge. So there's a lot to do. Just be careful crossing front street. That's all I ask. Okay, okay, great. And then if you want, folks wanna put in their calendar on Wednesday evening on August the 10th, we have our Messiah photo adventure. This is an educational uh, field trip and it starts at six o'clock. Uh, we will have Dennis. Um, no, Elaine, I won't be able to make it. Oh, excuse me. Uh, we have uh, myself, uh, Elaine, uh, Mike, and I forgot I don't have the rest of the folks. There. We'll have some experienced people there to take you through various stations of photographing, like getting orbs uh, from the sun, get them in the background of people. Um, getting uh, some macro shots, not like Dennis's bug stuff, but with, with flowers using a, a longer, a short telephoto lens, depth of field and stuff like that. And we will be doing a waterfall and we'll be doing a blue hour shot of the, um, of the uh, opera, not the opera, but the music center. And it's really a real, it's really fun. It really is. So that'll be on Wednesday, uh, August the 10th at six o'clock. And you'll get notice on that. Right. And there's other things coming up, but that's the immediate ones. I'm, I'm done, Dennis. Okay, very good. Thanks, Joe. Okay, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Mark Albano, who's running the show tonight. We have a member show and tell. So, Mark, it's all yours. Okay, we've got about, uh, we had eight, eight people submit um, images, and uh, we're going to go through them, let them talk about them, and get some uh, comments from the, uh, from the rest of us. Um, Dave, you are the first one up. Uh, do you want to show yours? Um, don't forget to unmute yourself when you go to talk. Do you want them to show side by side or the, or before then after? How about the uh, before and after, Mark? Okay, we'll do. I hope. There we go. Okay, there's your before. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mark, for coordinating this. This is a tale of two images, really, uh, not so much before and after, 
although I did start with the color. So what I'm going to do is really tell you how I ended up with a black and white image of this. Uh, I think, spoiler alert, you might have seen that. But um, I like both images. So let me speak to the, uh, the color first, even though I do prefer the black and white, which I'll talk about in just a minute. This uh, had some advantages for, for me. I liked the pop. Uh, to me, I'm not taking very many flower uh, photos. It's what I thought a tulip should look like. And um, it, it, I thought was visually attractive to me. I really desaturated it quite a bit, um, having the problem of uh, rendering uh, digitally uh, the red color on flowers. Uh, Joe Farrell and others have spoken about this, uh, having to do with the sensor uh, technology and so on. And I, I, I liked this, uh, you know, very much. Uh, for me, it was attractive. Toward the upper left, it was starting to get muddy for me. And then when I looked at the rest of the flower, I wasn't as interested in the, uh, in the outcome of this photograph. It, it, it seemed like the colors were getting quite muddy. Uh, Mark, you can uh, go to the black and white right now. So what I did is not so much, because I know somebody's going to say, well, you had a bad photograph in color and therefore you, you switched to black and white to you know, bail yourself out. It wasn't so much that, but I really wanted another version that spoke more to me. And this was really much better as far as I was concerned for three reasons. One, the highlights really seemed to be much improved uh, to me. The shadows were more pronounced. And I think most important, the shades of gray really spoke to me. This had almost a infrared kind of a take uh, to, to me. It seemed fluffy, it seemed more three-dimensional, and it really had the uh, dimensions, the definition that I, uh, that I wanted. Uh, I didn't get the muddy sense of the, of the tones, the shades of gray there. So it's not so much um, before and after. I, I think I liked both photographs uh, as I've kind of described. But uh, I think the black and white was much preferred, although I would say the complexity of the photo really spoke to me in both uh, black and white and, uh, and in color. And Mark, that's pretty much where I, um, I, I stand on this. Uh, if we're taking any questions or comments, Dennis, I'll be glad to, to answer. Yeah, we've got a couple minutes. Anybody have any questions or comments? If not, we're going to move on to Cindy's. Cindy, do you want to do before and after or be together? Um, you can put it up before and after. Okay. My computer is not behaving today. There we go. There you go. All right. So this was before. Um, this was the Lily Ponds trip. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to try and bring out some of the detail in the photo, which I thought was sort of distracting with the color. Um, you know, little bugs and, you know, these reflections and everything in the water just kind of distracted from it. So I wanted to bring out some of the internal structure of the flower and then just get rid of the distractions. So if you want to put up the after. So I played around with it, tried to get, you know, completely neutralize the background as much as possible and try and bring out the internal structure. And, um, you know, it just rained, so there were some water drops. So, um, that's the final result. And um, I guess I was kind of looking for a little bit of feedback or um, critique. Cindy, this is Joe Farrow. I love the reflections and how those reflected petals just look gorgeous on this shot in the black and white, whereas I didn't notice it as much on the color. 
Uh, but definitely on the black and white. I love that. Where well, they there they are in the color too. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, because there's so much other distraction in the in the water, which is what I worked on trying to get rid of. So first I played around with it in um, Nix color effects, and then I switched it over to black and white. So, you know, just to try and only bring out the flower itself. Indeed. And then I had just taken Dennis's class, so he helped me get, you know, learn how to get rid of all those distractions. Did you have black and white in mind when you took the photograph or is that the route you took to get to what you wanted to have at the end? Um, I didn't have black and white in mind, but um, I thought it made it more interesting um, because you could bring out the texture. Um, you know, it's beautiful. It was beautiful to be at the lily ponds, but then when I got my pictures home, I didn't feel like they were that interesting. So I thought the black and white makes it more interesting, dramatic. I think you are correct. Mark, can you bring up the black and white by itself for a second? Sure, hold on. Full screen. Yeah. Um, Cindy, I'm gonna make one comment. Okay. I'm, looking, I'm looking at the petals on the bottom petal, the one that's closest to me, to, to the viewer. I notice it looks like it's a little bit out of focus. Yeah. And have you ever tried uh, Topaz Sharpen? Um, I have not, no. You can get a free trial of that. And I would suggest you try that and see okay. what it does with that. I think you'd be totally shocked, okay? Because... Uh, it, it can do a really, really good job of that. And that is in post. And, okay. Um, but just as a suggestion. Okay. Yeah, I have the Topaz Denoise, but I don't think I have the Sharpen. So. Mm -hmm. Well, they have a trial to see if you like it first, you know. Okay. okay. Any other comments? Hey, Cindy, thank you. Okay. Dan Olson. Dan, which one do you want first? Um, actually, I guess, I guess side by side, I guess, if, if that's if it's possible. We can do that. Thanks. Here you go. All right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, last month we did a uh, a big family trip and uh, flew into Vegas, went up to Zion, and then uh, and then down uh, to. Um, uh, Grand Canyon and Sedona and stuff. So we're around, but um, so I knew of a uh, horseshoe and then didn't know where it was exactly. Didn't have it in my itinerary, but we were driving Northern Arizona down to the Grand Canyon. And then we saw the signs and we're like, Oh my gosh. So anyway, it, it was, it was a nice surprise. Um, did the half mile trek up there hotter than Hades. Um, but uh, 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 saw it. And so what I did is I took the, uh, I, I took the panoramic uh, panels there and then got back into Lightroom of course, uh, merge them. And then I did bring out the sky a little bit. Um, I forget the exact process, but, uh, maybe pulled up the blues and then, uh, and then, um, you know, whatnot, but played around with the sky, got a little bit of that. I don't recall deliberately playing with the, with the river. Um, uh, but it looks like I must've, and I, I, I meant to draw it up to see all the steps I did, but, but did, uh, draw, I think maybe bumped up saturation slightly. And then I forget what other things brought in the, sh brought up the shadows, I think, but anyway, um, long story short is since I'm mildly new and uh, that I do tweak until I get it. Uh, I don't start with any presets, but just, just tweak until I get it. And this one I was kind of pleased with. It seemed like it brought out what we saw and, and, and seemed to kind of pop. Okay. Dan, how many, you, how many shots did you take, Dan? Uh, um, I think it was four. Okay. Uh, it might have been three, but I'm pretty sure it was four. And I obviously didn't sub supply all of them, but just the, the, the center sure. one there. Yeah. Did you hand hold it or did you use a tripod? A uh, hand. Well, that came out great. That, uh, oh. And that's that's really, really a great one, particularly when you hand hold it like that. Hand right. it like that. Very nice. 
In fact, you know, Andrew, interestingly, since then, I've done some more panoramics and then also some HDR merges. And for some reason, when I get into uh, Lightroom, even though I started on a, you know, on, on a pedestal, it would, uh, it, it now doesn't allow me to merge. There's something going wrong. I, I, I cause it can't be my fault, obviously. Uh, mm-hmm. But somewhere in the software, it's now telling me it's not allowing it to merge either HDR or panoramic. And I'm, and I'm talking pieces that I've started, you know, um, you know, on, on a stand. Mm-hmm. So I got, I got, I got to work through some of those issues, but this one, it did to, to your point. Yeah. For a handheld, it did seem to, it played well. Didn't have, to, didn't have to do a lot of uh, doctoring up on the, on the proportions or anything like that, even afterwards. Mm-hmm. Did you do this with vertical shots or horizontal shots to make it your was, panorama? Uh, vertical. Yep. Man, this is Terry. I love the face that's on those rocks. Did you notice the face? I didn't, but as you started talking, I knew you were going to say that. So I do see it now. So yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's amazing how the, the 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 water cut through there and and made and that does. like that. Wow. Yep. And then yep. Uh, Dennis and 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 Dennis noted earlier um, that you know about the the boat, which was you know obviously incidental because um, there's a little bit of activity there, but the boat in the upper right adds a little bit of adds a little bit to the story. I think it leads your eye around nicely. Yeah, you, know, you tend to right. your eye tends to follow the water, and then you get you go, oh, there's a boat. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, this, this was definitely one of those uh, sh- uh, short hikes and and destinations that was worthwhile. I mean, it really would turn out. I mean, even though it wasn't, I, and I have, I'm a very detailed planner on the trips, and this one I left off. We just uh, again stumbled across it, and then uh, knew of it obviously, but didn't know it was on our on our path. But it was definitely turned out to be one of the highlights. We all enjoyed it. Dan, how close were you to the edge from that image? About 30 feet closer than what my wife was, because she's scared of heights. No, I, I, so, I, so I was right on the edge, and she was nervously sitting way over there. Okay. It is dramatic, though. To my, I mean, I don't think the picture even captures that entirely, but you're right. It is when you're up to the edge. There is, it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's noticeable because mm-hmm. you're taking in, you're taking in so much. Hey, Dan, if you ever get back there. One of the things that's neat to do is to get in a boat and go up that river. Some of the oh boats, yeah, in some in some spots the cliffs just go right into the water. It's actually magnificent to see it in photograph. And and you start at Lake Powell, I assume. Uh, actually, no. You you start at Marble Canyon. Oh okay. And they <laughs> they, they boat you up. I I used to fish the Marble Canyon area when I lived there. Oh, and I got to go up river one. I got to go up river one time, and it's uh, it's spectacular in its own right. Oh wow! Hmm. So you're gonna tell Melissa? Just to you're gonna tell Melissa you're gonna go back again to take the boat ride? Yeah, yeah, I'll mention I'll mention it to yeah. her. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Actually, they did. They you, you they do. They have a you know they take you down. They have a boat and or if the or you can get a guide and get your own boat and go up by yourself and do whatever you want. There's actually oh. campsites up there. Oh wow, yeah. We we don't yeah. camp. We usually we usually camp at the Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best place to camp. Actually. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Rod, how do you want to show them? You got to unmute yourself, Rod. Right, you have to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Sorry about that. Before, before. Yes. Okay. All yours. All right. This was just a a fun thing I I did a couple of years ago before I even got uh, into Lightroom or or Photoshop. Uh, I tend to tend to like to take uh, pictures of clouds from my my deck, and I I saw this cloud at at uh, sundown, and uh, it, the center looked really interesting. So I was trying to figure out something I could do with it other than just looking at a cloud. Um, so if you go to to before now, yeah, I got a far that. Yeah. 
And, and I got that dramatic look in there. And I, I thought that was, that was really cool. Said, man, what else can I do with this? Uh, like I said, I didn't have uh, Photoshop or, or Lightroom, but I had Luminar, uh, Luminar AI. So I took the photo into Luminar AI and started playing with it. And um, I started playing with uh, sky replacements. And one of the sky replacements was actually a sky replacement showing the, the Milky Way, and which is the, the next shot. Well, I guess you can't see that up close. But anyhow, I created my own black hole. And I, I just thought it was really cool. And that's with Luminar AI. Hmm. It's not a lot I can say about it. I played with it uh, to try and to, uh, you know, tighten it up. And, but most of it was just superimposing the, uh, the sky with the, the cloud, which created my own black hole. Well, it's interesting the way it blended it. You can see the stars through the clouds. Yeah, yeah. How easy is the sky replacement? Oh, very, very simple. I mean, you, uh, they, they have tons of uh, replacements you can choose from. And, and uh, you just, just try them out. Just hit a switch. I mean, just, you know, hit a button and it's there. Well, as is so typical, uh, Luminar was one of the first uh, companies, software companies to come out with a sky replacement. So I purchased it uh, at, you know, a, couple, a year or more, ago, I guess more than a year ago for that purpose. And it wasn't uh, long after that, that of course Adobe added it to both Photoshop and, and Lightroom. <laughs> and that's, that's a trend, by the way, if you see something happening in another program, the Adobe engineers are probably working on it, to, uh, thinking about incorporating it into Photoshop and Lightroom. You mean copying it? Uh, I don't use those terms, but you know. <laughs> Reverse engineering. Keep up, with the, keep up with the competition. Yep. Yep. Any other questions, comments? No, yeah, guys, feel free to chip in here. Comments, uh, anything at all. It's very okay, cool, right. that's for sure. It is cool. If, if you go back to the first one. Yep. What do you see in the cloud? A face. <laughs> it looks like Popeye. A little bit Popeye. like Popeye the sailor. Okay, oh, silhouette. Popeye. Mm -hmm. Out, outline Popeye for me. I need some help. <laughs> well, I can't do it here, but. It, he's on, there on the left hand side. Yep, on the left hand side. Huh. He's got a little bit bigger nose than Popeye has, but he's got that type of hat. Oh, okay. So a snout sticks out there, and then uh, yeah. like a cap on the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Rod, have you downloaded any of the uh, NASA pictures from uh, the Webb Telescope? Uh, I have. Okay. I haven't used them yet, but I, I have downloaded a few. Yeah, yeah, as I indicated in the uh, Facebook post and the email that uh, I have the one galaxy shot as my uh, uh, screensaver or my background on my computer. They're pretty cool. Yeah. So in, in terms of everybody, if you didn't see that notice, uh, NASA is ma has made available shots from the web telescope for free download and you can download high res copies that you can use for whatever purposes. Cool. I sent the link out in, uh, in an email. Okay. All right. Thanks, Rod. Next up is George Herzik. Hope I pronounced your name right. Close enough. Nobody gets it right. <laughs> Which What's one do you want first? Pronunciation? Doesn't, doesn't matter. They're after and after. I just okay. I just chose two images that I shot, you know, reasonably uh, recently to just uh, my style of work. Okay. Uh, George, what's the right way to pronounce your last name? Kurzik. Okay. Or, hey, you will be fine. Anyway, uh, typically, I 90% my work's on tripod, and it's almost always long exposure. 
I love using HDR and like all of you probably know, uh, the trick to doing HDR is to make it sure it doesn't look like HDR. And, uh, and that's what I like to do. <clears throat> this one's a relatively short exposure. I think the five exposures together come to 15 seconds. Typically I shoot closer to a minute and a half, two minutes when I combine my five exposures. I shoot a bracket of five, then I combine them using uh, photomatics. <clears throat> But this just happened to be a you know right place, right time. Uh, I'm, I'm down here in York, and I, I I live near the Wrightsville Bridge, so I like to shoot that on good evenings. So that uh, that uh, is uh, basically from the Columbia side on a good sunset. Okay. Other than other than um, HDR, any special type of processing or anything? No. Not really. Okay. You know, the usual contrast adjustments, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. And again, the same thing. This shot from the right cell side. This was during the winter. I wanted to capture the ice flows, uh, you know, on a cold winter night. And this one is, is a, a an exposure, five exposures combined to make about a minute and a half uh, total exposure. Uh, you know, same thing. I I kind of walked down the ice a little bit, set up the tripod and uh, and uh, uh, composed the image just so the clouds are moving right. And, uh, you know, there's a number of angles here I like and and, and shot that, so. The flowing of the water is so smooth, it almost looks like a very thin piece of ice. It, you know, it was a good evening. There was no wind. Again, I every time there's no wind, I head to the river because I can get reflections of clouds, reflections of things. And, uh, you know, with the long exposure, it tends to smooth things out as well. So, George, uh, this is Joe Farrell. Did you do a focus stack on this? Because I'm seeing that the ice is nice and crisp and sharp. And it looks like the sharpness goes pretty far down onto the bridge. Did you do a focus stack on this? I did not. I, I shot very, oh, I most of my work, again, I shoot very ultra wide angle and uh, typically F-16 or even higher up to F-22. Uh, you know, with the wide angle, it's very forgiving on depth of field anyway. So mm -hmm. it, uh, I, I, uh, I'm waiting for my next camera to get into focus stacking when I get that Z7 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Hey, on the, on the lower left corner, there's an obvious sheet there that almost looks like a, a pane of glass. Mm -hmm. Is there, but I, that's the only one I see. Was there something unusual there? Why that was either in the picture or something you know about that? Because the rest of the ice seems to be, you know, the cloudy broken up big chunks. And then there's that one sheet of smooth glass. Yeah, that's, on the a, left. that's a sheet of ice. Yeah, I when I stepped through part of the ice, I ended up picking it up and tossing it to the side. And, that's where she landed. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, it's, uh, but I thought it was kind of interesting because it, <laughs> I would like to, I was going to try and come back there the next day and use that ice to maybe shoot through and try to do something with that. Mm. Mm. Uh, George, a question for you again. Uh, what millimeter lens would you say you used on that? This was a, this is a shot at 16 millimeter. And was that on a full frame or crop? Full frame. Full frame. Very nice. But matter of fact, the other one, the previous one, was also shot at 16 millimeter full frame. Okay. Hey, Joe, how, how and, and and asking that full frame versus crop, understanding the concept, but how would how would that have made a difference in the photo, one way or the other? It would have um, it would have told me that um, um, it would have not it would have had a little bit more depth of field if it was a crop. Whereas in full frame, we have a little bit less depth of field. So that's why I was asking that. Okay. George, was your uh, camera touching the ice? No. No, I was on tripod. Uh, the tripod was on the ice, but the camera. Yeah, yeah. You got really low. Uh, I would say, you know, boy, that's a trivia question now. I'm thinking I was maybe camera height might have been three, four foot. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it's kind of a minor point, but compositionally, I, I love the fact that that tree shows up pretty much in the middle on, on the left-hand side of the arch. And I think that's cool. That catches my eye. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Mark, can you go back to the first image of his, for of George's? Yeah. I tell you, I think I find that one stunning. <laughs> I don't know how you guys feel about it, but that is just stunning to me. The Christmas and the detail of that is just spectacular. Yeah, this is the kind of thing I'm always shooting for. I'm always out. I'm out every other night or always looking around the water or looking around the hills here trying to find... Uh, I always get unhappy when uh, when it's a sunny day. I hate sunny day shooting. I like to go out when there's clouds and I go for the drama. So, Do you like it when it's windy and cloudy? I like mild wind. That way, if I'm shooting a minute and a half exposure, I get the sweep of the clouds. Okay. And which way do you prefer the, the clouds to be moving in your photo? I like them moving towards me, actually, or away. So it looks like it forms a V almost okay. um, over my main subject. Hmm. I've got, I could have sent a few of those in, but I, yeah, those I'll save for another day. <laughs> right. Yeah. What, what's the longest exposures that you uh, tend to do? Well, it, I use a 10X filter, uh, excuse me, 10X ND filter. Um, mm -hmm. And typically I've got my camera set up for auto bracketing. So it'll, it'll shoot a, a 15 second, a 20 second, a 30 second, uh, an 80 and a 10. I'll stack them basically you know, combine them in an HDR, that gives me a total of a minute and a half, minute and 28 seconds. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how I get those. Now, this one is not. Uh, I think this one came out to be about 12 seconds total over the five images. I, when there's good reflections in the water, I try not to try and go for a long exposure as much because then uh, the, the, the clouds in the reflection tend to lose a lot of definition. So I try to shoot shorter if I'm shooting reflective work. George, your exposure time on that one is just spot on because I'm looking at the water that's in the shadow on this side of the bridge, about right in the middle there. And you can see where you can see the detail of the water streaking. If you used a really long exposure, that would have been completely smooth and you would have lost that kind of a detail. And but I think that detail really adds a lot to the image. Yeah, I, exactly right. Uh, it, with water, and, and again, it depends on how much wind you have at the time. Uh, it, you, can, you can really, if you go too long exposure, you can really lose a lot. And, mm -hmm. and you want to leave something there. I think, I think you want to leave something there, you know, to, to you know, compo be a part of the composition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next next up is is Mike Donovan. Show them both at the same time, would you please? Yep. There you go. Okay, thank you. Um, this was on the trip to Lily Ponds. And the reason that I chose these is because I wanted to show what small changes can do. Um, the first thing that I, I didn't like, and we're looking at the one on the right right now, the before, a couple of things I didn't like. My tendency is to underexpose because back in the day when I started all this, with slide film, you were a third under all the time, a third of a of a stop under so that the coat of chrome would be rich and and vibrant well it's not necessary but i still do it for some weird reason and my tendency is always to underexpose so you can see that on the one on the right uh the second thing that i didn't really care for was the yellow on the um oh you can't see <laughs> using my cursor, but only I can see it. The, um, the yellow lily pad to the right, yeah, that, that. And there's a couple yellow ones in the back too. It goes straight up, Mark, with your cursor. Right, one more, one more up. 
There's a couple of yellow ones hanging around. Yeah, right there. A couple of yellow ones hanging around that are about the same value as the flower. The color, uh, the color was distracting, and the value, which is, I guess you could say brightness, we'll say, just for lack of a better, a better word, is competing. So it's kind of boring. It's kind of dull. I had a little extra room at the bottom. So what I did was, first thing I did that you can see on the left is uh, went with a, a brighter a brighter exposure so that you could see a little bit more of the shadows. Um, you can see the, the lines right behind the blossom and right under them show up better here than they do on the first one. And the other thing that I did was I took the eyedropper and chose the color of the yellow ones and then desaturated that color so that they look way more natural. They're not nearly the distraction that, that they were in the first place. Um, just a small crop and then sharpening up the blossom itself with a local adjustment. So really it was, it was the small things that, that I think made the difference. Um, a little more pop, a little less yellow, and a teeny bit of a crop on the bottom to, to pull the balance in a little better. Um, a little crop on top, you can also see that because the placement of the flower was imperative. It looks centered, but it's a little bit left and a little bit high. And then I put a border on there. So it's all small things that I think add up to make a difference. And that's that. How do you feel about colored borders as compared to white? Um, uh, colored borders to me relate to colored mat board in that I don't want the border to actually be a part of the image. I want it to be the border of the image so that there's a boundary there. There's, there's something that will make you look inside. So I'm, I don't really like colored borders. Um, just like I don't really use colored matte board. I use it like a cream or, or sometimes a white. Thank you. Mike, this uh, is Joe Mike, uh, Mike, this quick, is Joe quick question. Did you shoot this with a polarizer? Uh, I did not actually, no, but don't tell Joe. <laughs> well, it just looks like you've, you've, you've got enough penetration through the water to see the roots, you know. The, the, the sun at that, for part of the time, the sun was totally under the clouds. Mm -hmm. In fact, it even rained a little bit for part of the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really necessary here. And I, what was under the water, I wanted to look like it was in the background. Okay, Joe, you have Any a other question? questions? I, I have a comment, Mike. I want to give you one heck of a lot of credit for having the guts to put this up. You know, you have 42 people here that are trying to, to look at that image and looking for any spots or any little <laughs> dots to try and get even with you. <laughs> I forgot to mention the part where I took the spots out. I really did. I looked carefully because I can I I can hear myself. <laughs> Shoot loose, crop tight, get rid of the spots. I can hear myself when I'm doing these things. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's turn to tables. Critiquing that image, Mike, your own image, what would what could you have done better or what would you change if you were going to do it again? Oh, I see it as a 10 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I did too. <laughs> Come on, Mike. Now. Mike, as a homework assignment, the next time we meet, you've got to come back and tell us what artist this reminds you of. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's easy. I know somebody that painted gobs of water lilies. I can handle oh. that. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, um, is there anything you would do differently? Uh, as I look, I, I had thought about putting a, um, a vignette on it, but that would be too obvious because the background is already soft. Mm -hmm. So the tendency would not be to move into the back. The tendency would be to stay on the sharp. 
Um, I thought about there's a little teeny bug hanging on the, the near the top of the flower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a bug. And I thought about taking that out. So if I had to make a change, I might remove that. But it looked if you look really close, it's kind of cool because it's peeking up over the edge of it. And I thought I'm leaving him in there. <laughs> what what else did you take out? Um, I took out. If you see, look on the left side of the first image. Mm -hmm. You can see the edge of a couple water lilies right along the very border. And yeah, I took that out. Okay, why did I, you take those out? Um, because I don't want just like the teensiest bit sticking in. I want it either a lot or none. Because it's it's hard for the eye to complete that as a water lily. It's just a bothersome thing. And yeah, where Mark has his cursor, um, I worked on that and, and removed that reflection because it didn't do anything except distract. Uh, there were a couple, actually there were a couple white marks down in the lower left. There's a couple that I removed okay. Yeah, there. And then up and over a little bit right there and right there. So um, I'm happy with it actually. It, it's nice the way those lines underwater, the, the vegetation, point toward the flower. Okay. Yeah, that I, I really didn't notice it when I took it. Mm -hmm. So many times that, that, well, even doing an image review that the people say, well, my gosh, I never saw that. Well, I didn't see that either. But you're right. I do like the, um, the centering process of it. And diagonal lines are always kind of active, so it, it helps. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about the fact that the uh, water lily, the very top of it, touches the pad? Well, well Chris isn't here, so I'm not <laughs> worried. A <laughs> little bit of a merger there? Yes, it is. What? But my opinion is that since the light, the light blossom advances to us, and the background is soft and darker, so that recedes. It's kind of like another layer, really. Okay. Excuses, excuses. Okay, so it's a merger, <laughs> but there's enough separation that you you, you have a difference there. Uh, well, I think. Okay, that's good. Good reasoning. All right. How about somebody else? Okay. Yeah. You have the, uh, the rest of you can chip in here, guys. Okay, Mike. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jerry. Before. Come on. Okay, as you can see, this is a horrible, horrible picture. I didn't have any, <laughs> I didn't have anything in the background. It was a spare the moment thing. And uh, this is our first little girl we had in our family. We had six boys. And so I wanted to do sort of like a fairy tale kind of thing. And she was fussing and she was pulling her dress. I made that dress, it was a tool dress I made for her. And I wanted to do something, you know, like a fantasy kind of thing or a fairy tale. And so I finally put her on her mom's lap thinking that would calm her down a little bit. And we had to give her something to play with. So that's where the bear came in. So you can do the, the after picture. This is, this is more of a, instead of a photo, this is more of a, an artsy kind of thing. Like I said, I was trying to do a fairy tale kind of thing. It's not perfect, but it, it was hard to get her bear out to put the bunny in. And uh, I, um, I cut her out and I put a, a background of woods that I had taken. I'm not sure where it came from, but I put woods in and uh, tried to do things that would make it look fairy tale-ish. I was gonna put wings on her, but uh, I didn't do that. But I was just playing around and coming, trying to see what I could come up with. I'll probably redo it. <laughs> Sherry, sure. where'd you get that bunny? He looks nervous. Well, that bunny is actually a stock picture. I would not 
say to do that, but, be, but because what I was trying to come up with, I had to try to find something that I could use. Um, the background is mine and the girl is mine. And uh, I did cut out the flower and make it bigger. And uh, I added like colors and I blurred out some, um, some of the flowers to give it some colors in the background. And I was just trying to make it using sliders and stuff. I was just trying to blur things out and, you know, see what I could come up with. Do you have any particular technique that you use for blending them together to make it look like they're part of the same picture that they don't, you know, like the individual uh, components don't stand out? Probably um, the blend modes, hmm. depending on which ones I use. Okay. And how I got the, the background was, what is that? Not clarity. What's under clarity? Um, you have, uh, can't think what it's called. Dehaze. Dehaze. No. I dehaze. I put the dehaze down to get the whiteness. Hmm. And then I painted out, you know, the, the part that I didn't want to be light. Because I did different versions, and, and that one sort of really faded out. But I was trying to get a dreamy look. Wow. And you added, like, a dragonfly and some butterflies? I added the, the dragonflies and the, the deer and the, the bunny. Yeah. And the flowers in the front, I overlaid those. Because as you can see in the first picture, feet were sticking out. And yeah. I had yeah. a hard time of cutting out the, the dress because of <laughs> it being, you know, netted and stuff. But I'll, I'll probably redo it and see what I can come up with. But next time I'll do things different. I'll have her hold something simple or, or I don't know. <laughs> that must have been a real challenge to put the bunny in, in her arms. It was. It was hard because um, wow. I think that one, I don't have enough shadowing under her arms. Hmm. But I even had to, like, under her neck, if you look at the first one again, first picture again, under her neck, it was really dark. So I had to paint that out a little bit. And uh, it was terrible trying to cut this dress out, especially behind her mom, you know, and her hair and stuff. So, <laughs> hmm. but next time I'll, I'll do, like I said, they came to the house and it was a last minute thing and I didn't have things set up and, you know, so next time I'll put something behind her and maybe cover mom and have some toys there for her to play with to distract her so she's not crying. But she was trying to pull the flower off her dress and she hated it. She didn't like getting it on and hmm. doing a one-year-old is a challenging, <laughs> it's challenging. Yeah, well, that's some pretty sophisticated work in Photoshop with layers and layer masks and blending modes. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah. Very you're a real master at doing this. <laughs> if I'm, I really, you are. It just amazes me. I may ask, how long would it? Do you think it would have taken you to do what you described to us? It depends because I could do it, like maybe in a day or so. But then I keep going back and changing things, and I'm not satisfied. When to get the basic, I mean, it wouldn't be hard to get the basic. But then I try to add effects and try to do different things to it and stuff. And then I keep going back and changing the colors and changing the way it looks. And it seems like you're never satisfied. Sherry, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I think it is too. I really like it. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you, Sherry. You're welcome. Mr. Farrell. I'd like you to put both of them on the screen at the same time, if you could, please. I can do, whoops. Should be able to do that. Damn. It's not cooperating. There we go. Thank you. There, these are infrared uh, 
photos uh, taken up to the University of Massachusetts at the uh, uh, Northeast uh, Camera Club Council meeting last week. And on the right, that image was, um, and I just saw a dust spot on it. No, that's on my camp, my monitor here. I'm looking at um, that one. I was um, working on that, and I wanted to make sure that my camera was absolutely dead on to the tower. Normally, when I would take a shot like that, I'd be tilting my camera up, getting closer and tilting up. When you do that, of course, then you get the, uh, the effect of pyramiding, the effect uh, of that. And it looks just horrible because when you try and correct it, then you lose half of the image on the right or left. So I knew better that I shouldn't do that. So I had my camera and it was from where I'm holding it in my hand, these are all handheld, where I'm holding it in my hand, I'm pointing it directly at sort of like where the door is or a little bit above the door, just a touch above the door. And by doing that, I maintain the integrity of the, of the tower and it doesn't then have that uh, leaning back uh, kind of a look. And so that was, I used a 14 millimeter lens, a 14 to 30 millimeter lens. I used it at 14 millimeters on a full frame camera. And uh, that's how, that's what I was trying to do on the image on the right. Now, the, these are both are uh, infrared and uh, I have converted a camera, uh, one of a Nikon camera, it's a mirrorless camera that I converted to black and white uh, nanometer, I won't go through all that stuff, but I use it uh, because what it does is it takes, if you look at the left in particular, you see the white trees, those are green and they turn white. And you see the sky back in there and that's black because blue turns black. And then you see the, uh, the trunks of the trees and the lamp post and the bench. And those are, were like a dark brown or a black and they just turn darker when you do that. Now, the reason why I been using recently the infrared is because when I be out on a photo shoot and it comes around um, noon, noonish, let's say around 10 o'clock in the morning to about two or three in the afternoon, I wouldn't take any pictures because as you can see on the left, those are very harsh shadows. And on a, in, a, in a color image, that would look just awful because the, the dynamic range and the, and the harshness of it would look awful. But if you use infrared, I can shoot all day long. So I don't have to, to waste my time in the middle of the day. And I learned this with other photographers. I was out there, out there shooting away and here I am, I don't have an infrared and I can't do that. So that's why I got infrared. And that's one of the reasons I really like about it is being able to do that. That's the primary reason why I got it. If those would have been on a cloudy day or if that would have been in the evening after the sun went down, those shots would look just awful because now there's no light and there's no contrast and all of the trees like on the left where they're white now, they would turn a gray and you can sort of see that. If you look on the image on the left, there's some leaves that are up towards the sky and they're in shade and you can see how to the right mark, uh, well that there, there, but go, but go to the right over there, there you go, right in that area and they turn a gray when they, they need that light to be able to, to really make them look cool. And um, so the other reason why I have gone to the infrared for, for just those shots in the afternoon time when I can't really uh, photograph in color. Um, the, um, the reason I do it is because I, I carry it in my bag and, and everything is handheld. These are happy snapper kind of a shots. And I mean, I mean, they're composed and all that for sure, but I don't try and get a tripod out and set it all up. I just take the shots and with infrared, it's very forgiving that way. And, um, and, I, and I, like I like that concept a lot. Now you may have seen some images that people do in, um, in uh, infrared in their color. And the colors are really, really weird, okay? And I, in my, and I call them, in my mind, they're really, really weird. And 
to get those to make them look not like this, but to whatever their effect they're trying to get at, you have to go through a whole bunch of gyrations in Photoshop with channel mixers. I mean, there's just classes and they go on and on and on. And I just don't have the patience for that. So I made my conversion not into color, but I made it into black and white. And there's a, an A30 nanometer thing that you can do to make that happen. And that's what I did because I love black and white. Um, so um, to do this, you, you could can do uh, infrared in a couple of different ways. You can either, A, you could put a filter on front of any camera and, and attempt it that way. The filters for something like this would be like $130 if you were to buy it. However, that's very difficult to do because with the filter that would enable you to do this in infrared so that you only have infrared light coming into your camera is very dark. And so it would be very hard to see. If you look through the viewfinder, it would be very difficult to see, almost like putting on an ND filter, okay? So that becomes really difficult. And that takes the fun away because you're not spending your time composing, you're trying to whatever. Um, so that's one option that you have. The other option you would have, and this is what most people want to do, but many times they get disappointed with it. And that is take an older DSLR camera and have it converted, meaning that you send it away to a company like LifePixel or I forget the other one, and they will actually take out the filter on the front of your sensor, which right now on your regular camera is blocking the infrared. Well, they take that off and they put another filter in there that allows the infrared light to come through. If you do that on the DSLR, and if that old DSLR does not have live view, you are a crapshoot in terms of focusing. And that's really what the problem is because infrared focuses at a different point than what the infrared focuses at a different point than what um, normal light would focus at. So that creates a real problem when you do it. If you have live view on your DSLR, you can accomplish this in a much easier fashion. But it's problematic in the sense, from my experiences, when you're out shooting, if you're not going to be on a tripod and you, you're trying to use the live view, holding it up, and you and I have a really bright day, it's very hard to see the viewfinder to compose, and that makes it that makes it difficult in my mind. The other way, which is what most people are doing now, is they're taking a mirrorless camera, and then they were converting it because there's no because what you see is what you get. And so when you have it converted and you put the, the viewfinder up to your eye, you put the camera up to your eye, what you see is exactly what you're going to get. And you see like the image on the left, it'll look just like that in the viewfinder. And the image on the right will look just like that in the viewfinder. And there's no second guessing it. If you do something like that, and if you have a mirrorless camera, of course, I mean, they're expensive, um, you know, and I got mine as a refurbished and a used one through Nikon, and it's about $350 to have it converted. And, uh, and that's, that's what I did. And I carried it around. It's very important to also, if you do this, to know what lens you're going to use. For instance, my friend has a, the same kind of camera that I'm using, and we were out together, and he had a 14 to 24 2.8 lens, it was about $2,000, and his images looked like crap. And that's because it wasn't him, it was the lens. The lenses are such when infrared light comes in, it bounces around differently and it can create hot spots or it can create out of focus areas. It's really weird. Um, and when he knew that was a possibility because their databases will tell you which are good lenses and not good lenses to use with infrared. So I used on mine a 14 to 30 F4 lens, which is what these were taken with. And they are, um, they're, they're really sharp because it doesn't, has no artifacts because of the lens. And it's very, very important to know what lens you're gonna use when you're doing this. So um, that's what I did. I wanted to share with you why I did it and how I use it. And I'm just absolutely tickled pink with it. Any, Any comments, questions? questions? I have a question. 
when when you do your adjustments like when, with this kind of picture do you still adjust them like your if you're doing black and white like your reds and your greens and all does uh, that still work no, the same way or no because the reds and greens and blues are taken out of it okay with the okay. conversion so, so but you, that, but, right. but 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 it's the same process in the terms that you would do contrast clarity dehaze uh, maybe darken the sky. On the right hand side, there was clouds in the sky. So yeah. you see that it's not black. If there was no clouds, it would be as black as the one on the left of the sky. So um, yeah, you just do everything normal, but you just you lose that color uh, capability um, when you're doing infrared. And uh, what Sherry's talking about is if you're using your camera without conversion to infrared, and you say you want it to be black and white, it's really recording in color, and then it's converting it to black and white. And if you bring it into your processing program, it'll still be in, in the black, it'll be in the color format. And uh, so you can adjust it that way. But you don't have that, you can only have that capability here, but frankly, you don't need it. Okay. In my opinion. Hey, Joe. Hey, yes. What do you think about the Kalari infrared pocket cameras? I mean, they cost about 300 bucks. They come with three filters. Uh, pictures, kind of decent. What do you think? Well, I, I have no clue. I've never used them, and um, I, I don't know. I don't have any idea. I don't know. Joe, is there such a thing as HDR when you use your infrared camera? Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. Go back in the day, um, you said about the focus was different with infrared. Some of the older lenses had red lines, red markings as to where you would focus if you were doing infrared, mm -hmm. as opposed to just the straight um, focus marks. And I guess that's why, because it, it was off a little bit, like you said. And, and that's on the DSLRs unless you're using live view in the DSLR, you're using a separate focusing module. And if you have a DSLR without live view, the companies that do the conversion will want you to send in the lens you want to use. And then they will tune the um, focusing module to match that lens. And heaven forbid you change and put a different lens on, you don't, you're not able to do that. Uh, and that's what they, and that's why that red line was on there, Mike, as you're talking about on some of the older lenses because of that right there, because it focuses at a different point. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Um, Cindy, we're going to go back and do your other one. And then we'll finish up with mine. Okay. You can put them up side by side, I guess. Okay. That's easy, easier. If I can get my pull down work menu to work right. There you go. All right. So I didn't mean to have two, but I sent this in and then changed my mind and sent the other one in. But I guess I get to double dip tonight but um this was at the anderson town mill and i kind of i like these old dusty bottles that were kind of out inside and this light was streaming in but you know it was too like opaque i wanted to try and bring out the um detail in the bottle so i played around with um some of the color effects in uh the nick program and got this one that largely decolorized, but didn't completely turn it black and white. And then did a lot of stuff taking the dehaze, you know, uh, so that you could really see the reflection in the bottle and play with the shadows. So that my goal was just to try and bring out the detail of the wood, detail in the bottle, and play around with it that way. So that's about it. I don't have too much to add on that. Okay. Any comments, questions? Everybody wants to get out of here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Wow. 
it's like having some processing problems today. Let's do it this way. This was another shot done at Lily Ponds. I took this picture. This is the uh, this is the before. This is the unedited one. Um, I liked I liked the um, the flower. I didn't like a lot of the stuff around it, so I um, processed it down to this. Um, and what I did was is I basically masked the background, took the exposures down, and then I added another layer to work on the flower. And I like the way this came out, um, but one of the things that I tend to do because I work in layers is I'll I'll turn a layer off and on so I see how it affects the overall picture once I've built it up. And when I did that, um, I took I took out the layer that I used to darken the background, and I got this picture. And um, I found it interesting. This is this one here with the black background is. Kind of traditional the way you see the, a lot of pictures of flowers with a black background so there's no distractions and when i um took the background and eliminated the darkening effect of it i got this and i uh, ended up liking this quite a bit because it, it had some depth to it it had a it had the shadow in the background which i hadn't noticed before and um, the way the light streaked in in the back reminded me a little bit of the way they used to do um old black and white movies in the 30s and 40s for the background. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to ask for a couple of things here. Um, I'm going to ask our local critic, um, Mike Donovan, you know, Mike, if you saw these in a, pre in a, in a show, in a competition, which one would a judge prefer? I personally would prefer the one on the left because as bizarre as it sounds, that one has more depth than the one on the right. And you okay. would think that you would think that since the one on the right has a black background, that would just fall away completely. But the fact that you have the slightest bit of information on the left, I think really, really provides a foreground and a background as opposed to one flat image. Okay. Okay. What are other people's comments? Which one would they prefer and why? I'm trying Steve to learn Mark, something. This is uh, Dave Marchetto. Uh, yeah. Hands down, uh, the image on the right. And I guess it's because I'm, <laughs> I'm so focused on the flower and that uh, bee or, you know, the bug. So to me, mm -hmm. Uh, there's there's much more contrast. The the colors look more saturated to me, and that could be just the way you processed it, of course. But um, I I, um, I prefer the right. The I could see why the left has quite a bit of depth depth, but the uh, flower washes out uh, for my eye, whereas it doesn't on the uh, right. So if it were a flower photograph, that's why I would choose the uh, the, the right image. Hey, it's interesting you say that because the flowers themselves, the flowers themselves are processed identically. Yeah, that's very interesting because uh, I had to think they weren't. <laughs> so that again, you know, would argue very strongly for me, you know, that, yeah. that I made the right choice. But both are really very nice, Mark. It's nice to have uh, a really, really viable choice there. Yeah, maybe we could toss uh, that to Mike Donovan. You. Uh, Mike, you you've done a lot of study on color and visual perception. I've done a little bit, but talk to us about the appearance of the color in the flower as it relates to the background. There's a um, there's a, a famous experiment uh, of strictly of that nature that has a a colored square inside a larger colored square, and on one side it might be a green one against a red one. The other side, a green one against a blue one. And you would swear that inner square is a different color. But they're not. The 
the, the whole concept of complementary colors is that one makes the other stronger. And that works, well, it works here in this situation for sure. And by the way, Mark, um, since you went against me and picked the other one, if I were <laughs> you, I don't think I'd put in for the next image review. <laughs> Okay, I'll remember that. <laughs> that. Thanks, Mike. That, that's a very interesting concept because, Mark, as you said, you told us that both images, the flowers are processed exactly mm -hmm. the same, but yet when we look at them, our eyes and our brains interpret the color in the center of the flower in relationship to the background, and it, it can actually look different in the two pictures because of the different backgrounds. Part of and, that's because of the contrast. It's a it's a huge difference between the background and the foreground in the one on the right. And that makes the white even whiter. The one yeah. on the left, it's even the black shadow is is not as hard. So it's not as big of a contrast. So the white doesn't look as white. I have to agree with Mike Donovan because I've done one like this where I took the background and turned it all black. And now I see what Mike is saying. You have more depth uh, on the one on the left. Maybe if you could, um, no, I think I'd leave it just the way it is on the left. I, I go for the one on the left. Mark, I look at the one on the left and I see those green, is pointing right to the center of the flower. If you know they're coming in from yeah. the right, the upper left, and then the bottom. I just think it just it just really focuses right on that flower. That's what reminded me of some of the old some of the way they used to film the old black and white movies in the 30s and the 40s, where they used the the light directionally to to, to focus you on something. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Yes. I like the left yeah. one too because it sort of gives like a story with the light in the background. Um, would it be possible to make it a little bit darker to to give it contrast but still have the the lights and the darks in the background? Um, probably like in, like probably. in between, not too blacked out where you can't see anything, but a little bit darker. Yeah, probably could do that. But. Um, I like, like Joe said, I like the way the, the green points to it. Thank you. Yeah, one, one more from the Anybody peanut else? gallery. One more from the peanut gallery on that one, too, is I, I agree. The one on the left, I think, would be heavy preference only because uh, it gives us some kind of context, some kind of story. Because when I first saw the one on the right, I'm thinking I'm shopping for clip art or something like that. There's just nothing, nothing there. So <laughs> anyway, just one more, one more vantage point from, uh, from the peanut gallery here. Oh, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. I'm just trying to get a feeling for what people, how people think about these kind of things. All right. Thank you very um, much, everybody. I thought the pictures were great and the uh, conversation was interesting. And back to you, Dennis. Okay. Uh, Mark, Dennis, uh, we, yes, Joe. Uh, before, before we uh, terminate the session, I know you weren't going to do that. I, I jumped the gun on you. But I wanted to ask everybody uh, about the Anderson Mill. I would like to ask if you could in the chat, if you could just say yes or no. Yes, I would like to go back to the Anderson Mill or no, that's okay. I've had enough of the Anderson Mill. So if you could just do that because we're juggling whether or not we go back there or not. And we'd like to hear that kind of, uh, of input. Just say yes or no in the chat and then we will uh, uh, we'll just tally them up. Okay, I'm sorry, Dennis, I jumped in there. No, no problem, no problem. Mark, thanks a lot for organizing that this evening. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks to all of the members who shared their images and their stories. So anything uh, from anyone in closing? Any comments, questions? Just, just give it a second for them to uh, respond. Okay. Uh, we're up to 12 responses right now, and we have 38 folks. And uh, OK, as I said, no meeting next Monday. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll think about the image review for the 8th. I'll ask Mark to open that up. Mark Corchado, open that up on the website so you can start uploading your images right away. Who's doing the review on the 8th, uh, Dennis? Mikey. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is uh, get back time. <laughs> yeah, he'll repay. Let's see. Uh, 
you know, your infrared images there, Joe, you answered both questions that I had for you. The one was about why do you do black and white instead of color? And the other one was converting a DSLR as compared to a mirrorless camera. So the, the thanks, people thanks. that I've, I've borrowed uh, cameras before I, I bought mine uh, for have mine converted. And, uh, and I have to tell you, using the DSLR, um, it was it, it took the fun out of it frankly okay oh, whereas okay. the with the mirrorless i hold it up and i go look at it i compose it and i take the picture and i'm done okay and i don't have to do any of that when i will call and this is just joe farrell speaking because i'm not a photoshop guy doing all that crazy stuff in uh, in photoshop i just just very good hey while we have a minute let me put in a shameless plug for uh, my classes that i'll be teaching uh, I'm doing a, uh, I'm, do, I, I'm repeating the macro class. I've had so much fun. Uh, the first macro class I did at the beginning of the summer was during the day uh, at Calc. And now I'm going to do it again, but in the evening. So if you're at all interested in close up and macro photography, uh, I've learned a lot since the first class and I, I'll incorporate that in, into the next class. So it starts the Tuesday night. It's going to be in person at Calc the Tuesday night after Labor Day. Now, for you folks who are relatively new to photography and digital photography, or you just got a new camera, uh, I'm going to teach uh, get to know your camera, the fundamentals of photography on Thursday night, beginning the Thursday night after uh, Labor Day. And this is going to be at the Mechanicsburg Art Center. Okay, they're going full swing. They're back in business. So it'll be an in-person in class Thursday night, uh, beginning September after Labor Day. That's the fundamentals of photography. So that about does it. Uh, Joe, you think we had, that was enough time for yeah, everybody? We got, we got enough. We got a good feeling for it. Okay, last chance. Anybody have any questions or comments? Hey, Dennis, you mentioned in-person. Is there uh, any thought for the club going back in-person like they did pre-COVID? Oh, uh, we've discussed that at the director's meeting earlier this summer, and the general consensus was that things are going so well the way we have them running right now. We're going to continue running the meetings on Zoom indefinitely and the field trips in person. Thanks. So for, for the uh, indefinite future, that's the plan. Uh, we picked you. up members a couple of reasons. One is it's so convenient. You know, you don't have to drive right. anywhere uh, in inclement weather. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, it's just very convenient. And we've picked up members from out of the area, you know, like my brother Chip, who lives in Coatesville there, uh, and other people from all over the country, actually, uh, like Judy, who's yeah. out in Colorado, yeah. uh, that frequently joined the meetings. So uh, it seems to be working very well. What we're doing, well, and what's, we're coming up to the end of our, our year here at the end of August. So September marks the beginning of our new fiscal year. So we're putting together a new schedule and uh, one of the big changes that we're making or modifications in the meeting schedule, we have been this year or the past three years now, alternating between a regular educational program and an image review or a competition. So what we're gonna do starting in September is we're gonna alternate in three prongs. We're gonna start with the one meeting a back to basics meeting. So it'll be focused on the basics of photography, especially designed for the people who are or just getting started with it, okay? But certainly everyone's welcome to attend. The second meeting or, or next meeting would be like a regular educational program. And then the third prong would be an image review or a competition. Then we repeat that, that you know, uh, over and over again throughout the year. So the back to basic session will be, be new uh, it'll be what's similar to what we did in person when we had the in-person meetings at Bethany Towers, and we started at uh, six fifteen until seven o'clock. But this will this time it'll be a an entire meeting, uh, approximately an hour, an hour and fifteen minutes, devoted to some basic concept. So that's the plan. Uh, other than that, we're going to keep things moving pretty much the way they have been, because uh, quite frankly, things are going pretty well. So. Great. Any Thanks, other Dennis. questions or comments? Okay, guys. Thank you very much and good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.
Thanks Very again, nice. Mark.